Welcome back to Futures Edge. I'm Jim Urio. And before we do anything else, so this show has taken off um, and it's because of you guys. And I appreciate all the feedback we're getting. E everything you guys do has been just been wonderful. It's been a ton of fun doing it as well. Uh, this is a show where we try to demystify futures. Futures get this rap of being incredibly um, risky. Uh, and, and they are. They employ a lot of uh, a lot of leverage. They let you so we're trying to figure to, to teach you how to set stops, how to control risk. And uh, so far, some of you think we're doing a pretty good job. Remember what we talk about on here. We give trade examples, not recommendations. We have no idea what your risk tolerance is, how deep your pockets are. I want to stress that. We're showing you how we trade this market. As our guest today, someone who I haven't talked to in a long time, and I'm kind of excited about it, it's Ted Seifert, a, a chief market strategist of Zaner Ag Hedge. Um, Ted, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Jim, man. I'm excited about it. Okay, so you concentrate more. We're going to talk about beans. We're going to talk about corn. I've been looking at beans and corn charts for the last couple of years, and they seem to trade kind of in tandem. So one of the questions I'm going to ask you is what, what makes one go and the other not? Now, I see I've been driving home in a pouring rainstorm for the last yeah. 45 minutes. It's been raining every day here, and yet I look at my chart of beans and corn today, and it's through the roof. What what happened? What the, the drought's gone away. It's rained. It's like Portland in the Midwest. It's rained every day for two straight weeks. Why is it going through the roof today? Okay, so we had a big report today. It was our quarterly grain stocks report, which we get once a quarter. That was fairly bullish, but the big one was planted acres. We didn't plant as much acres of corn and soybeans as what we thought. We had built in this big cushion in the market because we have a lot of demand right now, and all of a sudden that cushion is kind of gone. So. It's funny you bring up Portland and how it's raining. Well, the problem is it's not raining in Portland. And while we don't while we don't grow a whole lot of corn and soybeans over in Portland, there's this massive what we call high pressure ridge that's sitting over the, the northwestern part of the uh, of the country right now. And they're hitting t record high temperatures. They're not just breaking records by a degree. They're breaking records by nine degrees. That's unheard of. It's 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 this is going to be a historic meteorological meteorological event that we will look back for years. But what that's doing is it's pushing a lot of heat and dryness over into the northwestern part of our growing area, areas like North and South Dakota, which, by the way, 10 years ago, weren't big players in the corn and soybean market. But this year, North Dakota planted 15 percent Well, North and South Dakota combined planted 15 percent of our overall soybean crop. And those guys are burning up. Um, we look at crop conditions every week. They're 30 percent good to excellent. Or I'm sorry, they're 30 percent poor to very poor. That's somewhat unprecedented. It's that crop's really struggling. And when we don't have these extra acres that we thought we had, boom, we're up 80, 90 cents in soybeans. We're locked limit up across the board in corn. We've got expanded limits tomorrow. Things can get crazier tomorrow. We are much more worried about weather because this balance sheet is so fragile, Jim. Uh, China has been a big player. They've bought 11 million metric tons of, of corn so far. They're expected to buy a, a, a whole lot of soybeans. Um, you know, just like every other raw commodity, demand is through the roof. So we had fairly tight balance sheets, meaning supply and demand were really very close. We didn't have anything really very much extra. Uh, but now we have to worry about that production. And if that production isn't there, then we'll be, we, ha we have to do what's called price rationing, right? And, and with commodities, you know, demand is going to buy somewhat according to the price, right? The lower the price is, the more demand there is, the higher the price is, the less demand there is. And if we have a certain amount of demand in mind at a certain price, and we feel like we don't have the supply to meet that demand, we got to push prices higher so that we can ration or kill off some of that demand. And that's really what we were seeing in the soybeans today. But again, we talk, we're going to talk about inflation. Uh, soybeans are a really wonderful uh, inflationary hedge, a sneaky one. You know, go back to 2008. Um, you know, soybeans and gold were the two things that everybody was looking at for inflation. Again, it's not one that everybody thinks of right away, but that is a big one there. Uh, but again, demand for, for raw commodities is through the roof, specifically to China. China is the largest soybean purchaser in the world. They import about 90 to 100 million metric tons of soybeans every year. The next largest importer is the EU as a whole. At about 16 to 18 million metric tons. Huge, so, huge difference. So, we, okay, you mentioned China, which I was going to get to China too. Um, when you, when we have a new administration now, it's not getting a lot less new. Do you look at things like different sort of trade restrictions, trade deals? When Donald Trump was in office, when all of a sudden we started talking about things like tariff, are you more of ground up, and in this case, literally the ground, or do you yeah. look at the top-down strategy as well? Yeah, so- 
uh, you know, we were talking about trade deals pretty much every day. Because again, soybeans is the number one export the United States has to China. We were talking about trade deals every day that Trump was in office. We haven't really talked about it hardly at all with this new administration because it doesn't seem to be a priority of theirs. Basically, all they've said is that, hey, we, we're just going to continue on with that phase one trade deal that we we had in place from Trump. Um, so we're just kind of operating under the idea that the phase one trade deal is still in place. So far, as long as China's buying, we don't have to be concerned about that. Uh, we do worry that you know China does something silly like invades Taiwan. And then we say, okay, all deals off. We're not doing any business with you or South China Sea or really any number of fronts. Now the India India is moving 50,000 troops to their border uh, because they're worried about China. Uh, so if China was going to make one of these moves, that would cause a big problem. But I got a, I got a theory here, Jim. I think China's going to do that. I don't think they're ready to it. I think they're hoarding commodities, in particular agricultural commodities, because they have to feed their people. I think they're trying to build a five-year stockpile before they make these big moves that they have the intentions of doing. And I don't think they're quite done with that. It's a big deal. I like dropping bombs on the futures edge. Remember, people, that we talk about big things here. Okay, so uh, the com commodity collect. Well, first of all, let's talk about the huge commodity run-up that happened to it. And now I'm branching yeah. out, not just beans and corn, but lumber, copper. Right. Uh, things just went through the roof. In my mind, a lot of it was inflation was a dollar hedge. Now, it, obviously, things seem to be separating a little bit now, and things are starting to march to their own drummer again. Do you see that to be true, and do you expect that to continue? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, look at the dollars rallied well off its lows. I mean, we were at right. 89.60. Now we just made a, a new recent high, almost 93 or so. Um, and that dollar is important because, well, especially for agricultural commodities, but exportable commodities. Let's say that. You know, commodities that are big on export, when the dollar is higher, that makes it more expensive for other countries to come in and buy our products, right? It also makes it uh, uh, less expensive for us to go in and buy other countries' products so we can be importing more that way too. It also means that you know when the dollar is worth more, commodities are intrinsically worth less. Not worthless, but worth a little bit less because the purchasing power of the dollar. But I would say the dollar is in a more normal territory now, so we're not into this you know, hyperinflationary, at least, stance in the dollar. So yes, we are kind of operating more under uh, what our, our individual market fundamentals are. However, I don't know. I'm a little skeptical about this bounce in the dollar. We've dumped way too much money into this, into this market. I think we're going to see more pressure on it. The reverse repo market has been really hot. So we've taken some of that M1 out. I think, we'll, I think the Fed's looking for ways to put that back in. And if that happens, um, you know, I, again, I, I see more pressure on the dollar. But okay. you know, take, I, I, I want to add something to what you really said quick about the dollar is because the sure. way we measure the dollar and the dollar index is against the euro and the yen, essentially, yeah. where they're doing the same things as we are, too. So yeah. I think, you know, my new dollar index is going to be about 20 things and beans is going to be in it. I want before we get to your trade and we are starting to get a little pressed for time was when yeah. lumber and all those things cracked last week. Was that a market position thing or did the story really fundamentally change? Well, so the, the story for, for lumber really fundamentally changed because, I mean, lumber was one of the ultimate uh, lockdown trades, right? We're stuck in our houses. We're building additions. We're improving our houses, things like that. Now that we're getting back out there, we don't want to do that as much. New home sales have been down, but that's because builders slowed down because of the price of materials. That will start to pick up. So we've seen a big slide off the highs. At some point, lumber, I think, bounces. I don't know if we're there yet. Uh, but that was a, a totally different kind of fundamental factor there. Copper has come off the highs, but it's really holding on to its 100-day moving average. It's found some good support here. I wonder if that bounces. Um, you know, crude oil, I don't know. To me, looks really toppy, but that's been a better gauge of inflation than maybe anything. Um, and also the new administration, you know, not very sure. uh, crude oil friendly. Okay, let's, let's get to your bean trade, which I want to yep. tell everybody too. And I can verify this. We've been talking about this bean trade for about since two days ago, where Ted was bullish beans. Now, beans have screamed today. I can swear yeah. to you that he was telling me beans were going to scream a day ago, but let's see what your trade is now. Yeah, right. I mean, should have had me on two days earlier, but I still like <laughs> this trade a lot for all the reasons that we talked about at the beginning of the segment. Uh, I, I think beans have a, a really good chance of making record highs. And this, recommend, this recommendation, you know, if it goes to record highs, you've already made money. Example, $2. example, flag, example, not recommendation. We don't do recommendations here. Go. Example. <laughs> <laughs> yes, example. Okay, so my example is in the November soybeans. It's got quite a bit of time left between now and the end of October, basically. 
Uh, I want you to buy, or I, I want to buy there, Jimmy. <laughs> Uh, I want to buy the November soybean 1460 calls, and then I'm selling the November soybean 1560 calls. It's costing me about 25 cents to do that. It closed today at 26. If you get a little bit of pullback and buy them cheaper tomorrow, that's even better. Uh, but you're paying 25 cents in the beans. That means your risk is $1,250. Uh, the potential on it at expiration, if we're trading above 1560, which I think we will be, that position is going to be worth $5,000 for a net profit of $3,750. Again, your risk is that it expires worthless. Something changes. China goes to war, blah, blah, blah. You're out $1,250. For me, that's a very tolerable risk reward. It's about a one to four. Uh, I really like that a lot. And fundamentally speaking, uh, coming from a guy who trades soybeans all day, every day, I, I really like this trade. Uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm a real big fan. I do too. We're running out of time for this too. Remember that those, you know, a lot of those bean contracts and corn contracts, they're still not micros and minis on those. Those are still big boy contracts. So understand your risk going in when we talk about these trade examples. Ted, so good to see you again. I haven't seen you in a long time. Great to talk to you. You are a wealth of knowledge as always. Yeah, thanks, Jim. It's great to be on the show. Uh, have me back anytime. Yeah. Also wanted to mention a couple things. Keep an eye out for CME who's launching a new suite of micro products, including micro crude, which me and Bobby are both very, very excited about. And I do want to thank them for sponsorship of this show. 24 seven access to diverse global markets right here. That's why I added stock index futures to my trading strategy. Now, when I see ups and downs coming, I'm ready. Well played. I added futures to my trading strategy. Now, I have 24-7 access to diverse global markets, including crude oil. Like I always say, leave no opportunity untapped. <laughs> I'll just sign that. Yeah. Got it. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities. Trade confirmed. And I have global access 24 seven, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I wanna do. Visit your online broker today to learn more. Welcome back to Futures Edge, I'm Jim Urio. We just had Ted Seifert with a lot of interesting stuff on corn and beans, which is stuff that I look at a lot, but don't trade as much as I used to. And I was glad to hear a lot of that. We have Bobby Iacchino, Chief Market Strategist for Path Trading Partners, frequent guest on the show, a lot of fun, a wealth of knowledge. Bobby, good to see you. <laughs> black t-shirt again, weird, right? Yeah, Italians have to put on a black t-shirt. This, to me, feels bad having something other than black on. It feels like itchy, like I want to tear it off. You feel me? Yeah, I didn't even think of it. I looked in my closet after we had that little kind of fun chat about black t-shirts, and I'm like, wow, I've got like 46 of these things. I mean, I might <laughs> want to branch out a little bit. <laughs> no, you don't. Don't just keep. You're down in Naples, the home of retired Italians. Just go down there, wear your black T-shirt, and live it. I love it. Uh, let's, we, let's talk about crude. I just we, we were talking before about the CME's micro crude contracts coming out, which I'm glad about. And the reason I get glad about it is because I like to trade options, and I like to, with precision, um, be able to you know uh, cover things, hedge my risk, change my deltas to exactly what I want not using the whatever thousand barrel contract having to use, which is a big boy contract. Let's right. talk about the direction of crude. Crude, first of all, why is crude rallied? For, I have my opinions, as you will probably guess, but why is crude rallied for the, over the last few months? And why does it continue to rally? I think there's two main reasons. I mean, one of the things, and Ted touched on this with ags, right? By the way, it was really cool to hear about soybeans being an inflation trade. I'm actually going to do okay. some work on that because that's not something that I would have ever said out loud. But Crude oil, obviously the demand continues to increase with the economies opening up. We're seeing a little bit of shutdowns with the Delta variant. I'm not sure how much that has legs, but overall the demand is growing. You saw the OPEC, uh, the, the leaks that we got prior to the OPEC meeting, which is tomorrow, that their demand forecasts are up. And because OPEC is the marginal producer now, they're slow to fill that void. It's not like when the U.S. was doing it. U.S. shale wells and wells in general are still well below 400, uh, the high of that 12 to 1400. I don't have the exact number in front of me. So we're way below where we should be in order to be the marginal producer with CapEx suffering. So you're looking at OPEC filling the void 
when the demand uh, exceeds the supply. Their prediction, 1.5 million barrels shortfall in August, 2.2 million barrels shortfall in the fourth quarter, unless they increase production. So we'll find out if they do. So are you saying, it was this kind of a, a, a tip of the cap to capitalism? Like when, the, when we're producing, when prices rise, we scramble quickly to increase production and competitiveness does that. A place, you know, a, a monopoly on it, they sometimes like to see the price rise a little bit and get used to a certain level before they click the spigots on a little longer. Yeah, it's absolutely a nod to capitalism. It's interesting because there's, there's some places where capitalism isn't perfect, but in the crude oil example, just anecdotally, um, some of these wells, and once you start them, especially the shale wells, they produce a ton of oil initially, and then they slow to a trickle, but that trickle continues for a while. And as prices dropped, a lot of these drillers in the U.S. just kept saying, well, let's get the oil out there before the price falls more. And who benefited from that? Us, those of us buying gasoline and heating oil and plane tickets, which had lower cost jet fuel. And that's the way it's supposed to work. And then when it got too low, they stopped the CapEx because they went bankrupt or didn't have enough money or whatever. So it's really the way that it's supposed to work kind of played out in crude oil. Don't want to get screamed at by the people talking about subsidy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about shale supply versus demand, where it was and where it is. So when you think of now, and I know you were bullish last time I talked to you about crude, and are, are you still, and is it because, have we pegged what this rebound the level of robustness, if robustness is a word, or is it going, is this reopening, provided we don't see any sort of big shutdown from the Delta variant, which is obviously a big deal. And I'm not saying it's a big deal medically, I'm saying certainly it's a big deal economically. So is your thesis still demand growth domestically? It is, and it's demand growth internationally as well. We haven't seen demand pick up from India yet. Um, we have seen it from China. You know, interesting, you mentioned the mic, the Sweden micro products. I'm actually looking down because I want to make sure I got the right date. July 13th, I'm uh, doing a webinar um, along with Paul Kamout from the CME group talking about these micro crude futures. And you mentioned that I was bullish last time and my trade hit its target and I wanted to stay in it. In which case I would have with the micros because I would have scaled out as opposed to left all that money and all that risk on the table, which is a, a popular thing I do in stocks and a lot of the futures I trade where I take portions of them off. So yeah, that's a long way of saying I'm still bullish, but anytime a move gets extended, just the natural progression of things makes it lower probability that, that move continues. Crude oil being a pure supply and demand market means that it goes sideways when the market perceives balance, and then it spikes or it falls when it perceives it being out of balance. That's what it's perceiving right now, so I'm still bullish. When you sent me your notes, you mentioned silver and that you were interested in talking about silver. Why? Gold and silver have been pummeled. I did think, you know, gold yesterday broke out of a range to the downside and then quickly rejected that level. So that me made me slightly interested. So I was glad to see your notes. What do you like about silver? So silver, there's a physical shortage. Um, might be part conspiracy theory, but there's also pieces of those cons conspiracy theories that I know is fact. Uh, for example, Sprott Silver Trust uh, last month bought up all the physical supply that was available in the US and had to go overseas to buy the rest to back the inflows into their ETF. Into their ETF. And that's a uh, fairly factual statement, unless somebody proves it wrong. I've got multiple anecdotes from that being true. There's a physical shortage. The amount of silver and platinum that's going to be used in the electrification of the world is going to increase the demand there. And there is a physical shortage. So it's interesting because I want to be short term, long silver, medium term, short silver, long term, long silver. So I've got my long-term position and I'm trading around it right now. And the best way for me to trade around it right, right now is for a quick long trade. So can you tell me about the long trade? Yeah, I want to buy silver basically where it sits as we speak right now. It's about 26.20. And I'm going to stop myself out at about 25.75. And I've only got a target of about 26.80 on that, 60 cents. That may not seem like a lot, but that would be about a $3,000 P&L on the big silver to the good, risking about $2,250 if I got stopped out. So it's a fairly large contract at this point. From that perspective, you do see moves in silver. It'll go days and days and days where it only moves 30, 40, 50 cents. So it's actually a pretty big move if it moves that 80 cents. 
And I, I will underscore something that Bobby said too. That silver's five thousand dollar contract. That's a big boy contract too. There actually is a micro two that's a thousand um, ounces of silver. Uh, did I say barrels? It's five thousand ounces and a thousand ounces of silver too that I trade on occasion too. That's actually relatively liquid as well. So uh, that's an interesting trade. Let's let's move on to stocks real quick because I know we don't have you forever. Stocks have been grinding high. To me, it was. You know, we, we rallied on the reopening, we rallied on the Fed, we rallied on the government. I'm still bullish, but I'm worried now that there's nothing left to rally on, except maybe we're underestimating the strength of the recovery. What are your thoughts on equities? I agree. Uh, this is, I mean, God, Jimmy, I've been saying this for shit three years now. I'm long and I hate it. Um, we're long equities right now. We're actively covering positions. We're a lot more active. Uh, in our stock portfolio, our normal hold time is about 25 days. That's actually been lengthening, not because we want to stay long, but because targets aren't being reached in the value model that we use. So that to me means naturally that the bull market is slowing. I can just pick up again, right? It can be just taking a jogging rest before it starts to sprint again. But there are so many potential headwinds and I just can't see a path to all of them going away. Right. And I, like I said, I'm so bullish in my longer term, my investment account that I don't trade. I took the opportunity over the last week to rebalance because I think in our business, you know, we have a saying about how you know bulls can make money, bears can make money, pigs get slaughtered. And that's how I think, you know, when big corrections happen, I think people never really rebalance their portfolios to their risk tolerance. And I did that. And I'm also still bullish on the short term. And one thing I like, and I've argued with some people about this, argued with Michael Farr about it this morning. He thinks the NASDAQ taking the lead was a net negative because really what it is, is a, it's, it's a, you know, kind of implicit that rates aren't, uh, are going to stay low and it's almost like an economic negative. I disagree. I think that would be the case if only the, those big balance sheet, Apple, Amazon's Google were tracking everything, but it was pretty broad based and the dollar was rallying too. So I'm still bullish and you know, and everybody, and if you guys watched Bobby's show on Monday of this week, I went into a long, arduous journey about why I trade the call condors and call flies. I have them on all the time. They work for me so far, so I'm not changing my um, my, the, my modus operandi here. So here's the trade, Bobby, and I want you to tell me if you like it or not. This is the Wednesday, July 7th, so it's a week from today. The 4310, 4345, so that's 35 ticks wide call spread. Buying that. Selling the 4350, 4380 call spread to help finance it. I got that on for eight ticks, which is 400 bucks. Risk 400 to make 1350. You're buying a 35 tick wide, you're selling a 30 tick wide. The reason I like the condor instead of the flies for two reasons. One is that there's five tick space in the middle where any there you start, you could potentially make the full amount, which we never make the full amount on these. I always cover them before. Plus, if it screams higher, the fact that it's imbalanced will still have it being worth five ticks, even the market screams, you know, 5% in the next couple of days. Thoughts? So three things. I like the trade because I am bullish, even though I hate being bullish. I have no choice. Amen. I, it's, it's, you know, where else are you going to go? Whatever that acronym is now. I don't remember what that acronym is now. But um, So I, I like the trade. I, the second thing is I happen to agree with Michael Farr that it's bad when tech leads but it's still bullish. So the ideal situation to me is that the Russell leads and the NASDAQ is positive, right? That's the ideal thing to me. But if you can't have the ideal, then you do the options trade in the one that's more likely to move. It's like in three scenarios, the NASDAQ goes higher. In the fourth one, all of them go down. Right. So I like the trade a lot. So, But anyway, so I was gonna ask you another question and it's about rates. We've been talking about rates um, you know, all day. I've been doing media stuff today. And we we're talking about rates. And the the fact that 10-year yields went from 1.7 to 1.4, does that mean people aren't um, worried about inflation anymore? And you know I have an answer ready to pounce on you if you don't give my answer. What do you think? I think they believe the Fed has it under control. I don't think that they don't expect inflation anymore. I think they think the, the Fed has it under control. And you can see When that. you say has it under control, do you mean has inflation under control or has the yield curve under control? has the yield curve under control. That's what yeah. I think. And I think the, by default, that means the market believes they're going to be able to manage inflation as well. Because if you have 140 10 year and you have 5% inflation four quarters in a row, that's a freaking disaster. Like that's a horrible economic situation for anybody, especially the elderly who are living on a fixed income. 
in any situation. So tell me this, if the Fed stopped buying, okay, this is a question about the yield curve and the 10 years predictive volume. You and I, you, you, we've been rates guys forever and we yeah. look to the yield curve to give us signals about things. What would happen if the Fed stopped buying 80 billion a month of US treasuries? <laughs> We'd have an inverted yield curve in a recession. I mean, it would happen pretty quickly, right? <laughs> Okay, so so you think long end rates would go down because everything else would collapse? Is that what you think? Right, right. Okay. I mean, essentially, you'd have people getting in the shortest possible. You know, they want to be able to get their money back as quickly as they can. That's flight to flight to safety, not flight to quality, but flight to safety is usually short term. Whatever you can do short term, so that you can have your cash in hand. There's the last thing, and we got to goodbye in a couple in about thirty seconds. But you mentioned silver and platinum, which are slightly more to the industrial side than gold. You still like gold as a dollar hedge? Is that lost its shine? God, I can't believe I did that. Absolutely yeah. try. I, I take that back. Wind the tape and cut that out. What that's like a, that's like a Kilburn cliche. I know. Oh, I know. The golden domer. Always <laughs> talking about Doctor Copper. God, that's oh tiny. Jesus. <laughs> anyway. Um, no, I think gold, as long as you see uh, the markets believing that the Fed has the yield curve under control and has the tools to fight inflation, gold suffers. I don't like gold here. And it's strange, right? Because I like silver. My silver trade is pretty short term. My long term silver trade is about a physical shortage, which is infrastructure, not inflation. Uh, thank you very much. This has been a ton of fun as always. Usually this show is, we do it on a Friday, which means I'm heading to the bar right afterwards. It's a Wednesday, so I still have to wait a couple of days, which is a little bit depressing. Although I might pop over there anyway. Just a little. Bobby, thank you very much. It's been good fun as always.